Okay, everybody, shut up. So, empathy. Honestly, I just wanted to start the presentation in an awkward manner, and it seems we're <laughs> off to a great start. So, you're in the track session called How We Develop Organic Groups uh, 8 after two years with Elm. And if you just, you know, stick your head uh, for a few seconds and you know, you're not going to stay, so the, very, the, the short, uh, the quick answer is we are uh, developing it very, very slowly. <laughs> Any questions? No, thank you for coming. Bye-bye. <laughs> However, <laughs> if you want to stay here for the next hour, there is obviously uh, a longer version. But for that longer version, you'll have to sit down, lay back, and I will have to take a few steps back, and in fact, a, quite a few steps to the side, and tell you about the path that uh, I've been taking in the past two years, and as a consequence, uh, Gizra um, as well. So, my name is Amitai Burstin. Amitai Bu is the nickname. I'm the CTO and co-owner of Gizra. We have a few fancy clients, name drop, name drop, name drop, name drop. And like uh, my real sales pitch that looks somewhat like that, about 60 seconds after I present ourselves and we establish the fact that we are awesome developers, we are saying that most of the IT projects uh, around the globe are failing. And when I'm saying failing, it means that they are unable to meet at least one of uh, the three items, the definition of success, on time, on budget, or customer is happy, or what we call the unholy trinity, all of them. And when I'm saying that a project will fail, I don't mean that it will not be published. There is a good chance that the audience here and the audience at home knows what a uh, failing project is. It means that it's not published on time, or the budget is exceeded, or there's a lot of frustration, and the customer is not happy, and you are not happy, and so on and so forth. And for many years, I had this slide of how to solve it. Uh, and I was thinking that the answer is, communication and setting expectations. But honestly, as time has passed, I kind of realized that that's, that's the technique, that's the mechanic. I have actually a different answer for that, how to solve it since 2017, and it's find and develop only the essence and time box the efforts. So find and develop only the essence, basically it means don't listen to your clients. Um, and I'll give you an example of how I make dinner to my kids. And uh, if you have kids at home, uh, you might relate to this story, and maybe uh, we'll see a few nods in the audience. So at a certain point of time when I'm offering them dinner, I know that they can handle only fruits. So I offer them fruits, but they insist also on sandwich, and pizza, and pasta, and salad, and cake, and milkshake and potato chip, and also the slimy, sugary thing that I need to clean after them uh, later on, and tortilla, and biscuits, and salmon. Oh boy, they are so into salmon, they are saying. And vanilla cake, and some chocolate cake to balance it, and yogurt, because why not? And they really insist, and I know it's going to end, to end really bad, but I try to be a good dad but those small, manipulative bastards. And honestly, at that point of time, I think they're not mine. It's obvious they get a kick out of it, and it's clear that they're not going to eat any of it. And then my wife joins, and she starts with all her accusations, and she goes all crazy, and then I start with the accusation, and then I go crazy, and then I start screaming at my wife, you and your mother are going to take me down to my grave? I actually wrote down, chill out, man, in my notes. <laughs> so that's how projects are run. So, <laughs> so we need to serve our clients only fruits. That is, we need to serve them, we need to develop for them what they really need, not necessarily what they're asking for and what they can afford. And it's easier said than done because if I would tell you uh, when you come with your awesome startup PID and I will tell you, no, I will not develop that. Just tell me what is exactly, what is the essence of what you need to do. Oftentimes you're too emotionally connected to what you're doing and you say, no, I need everything, all the features. And I don't think it's the case and it's our job or at least 
my job in, in, in Gizra to convince the client that it's best for them to indeed remove, I don't know, 90% or 80% of what they want and develop only uh, the essence. The second thing is about time boxing the efforts. So, where am I? So a project is basically the sum of all its tasks, right? So I don't need to reach, I don't know, six months down the line, nine, uh, six months down the line or nine months down the line to the end of the project just to realize, oh my God, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna uh, reach uh, the deadline. I can actually do it almost in real time per issue. So the way we are doing the time boxing is we are saying we have a certain issue, a certain feature. We try to time box it. To time box it. No, it's not we try. Every issue will get a time box, and it will be a small time box. It's not going to be 40 hours or 100 hours. It's going to be two hours, four hours, six hours. More than that, it's like it's better to, to divide it into smaller, into smaller issues. And what is, the, what is so important about time boxing? It's not necessarily just for the developers. But it is about setting the expectation. This is the way we're setting the expectation to the client. Because if I'm, setting, uh, if I'm setting the time box for a certain feature for four hours, they're going to get the feature in a fourth four-hour development. They are not going to get it in 40 hours. And I'm saying that because developers, for example, if you let them uh, you know, develop the, the menu on the nav bar, they can do it in four hours, and they can do it in 40 hours. <laughs> really. And then it, makes it, it makes them happy to do it in 40 hours, but nobody is paying for those 40 hours, and setting the expectation is so important. So for clients, oftentimes, you know, they don't really know what four hours get them, and we all know that the answer is hardly anything because it's just four hours. But in the end, those four hours has, have also a monetary value, so you can communicate it, and you can communicate it with everybody. So I can tell the client, listen, it's going to cost you uh, $1,000 to do a certain feature. And they understand what $1,000 means. And I can communicate that to the account manager and to the developer, and they can understand it. So those hours, in a way, it's also kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If, it's, if we're saying that it's four hours, then it's going to be four hours. And, and the thing with time boxing, you really need to commit for, to that. Like for many, for many years, we had the idea of time boxing in Gizra, but we weren't really committing to that. Right now, we've reached the point that when somebody is approaching uh, me with a problem in their issue, my first question is, how are we on the time box? Like, I care more about the time than I care about the task being completed. Obviously, I care about it has been completed, but it's just about priorities. And ever since doing that, we are seeing a really a major shift in, in this cycle, in this communication, in the setting expectation between everybody, the client, the account manager, and the developer. In a way, everything that I'm saying here applies also, I think, in a way to Drupal or contribution as, as a whole. I mean, the essence, you know, finding the essence, this is something we're talking about in Drupal and other places. What do we really wanna, want to do? But also kind of time boxing is there, meaning if I'm a contributor, I don't expect anybody like Dries going in the issue queue and writing, okay, you should do it in 12 hours. That's not how contribution is done. But there is a thing that we are actually paying. We're not paying with money. But there is a thing that if you exceed the time that you are expecting some, somebody to write a feature or something like that, you get people who burn out or people who just drop out of things. So it's super important also, I think, in contribution in you know, putting a border of what we want to be developed, how long it should be developed. And this is also setting the expectation to the developers in the contribution. Do we want a crazy feature that is thinking about all the edge cases? The answer is no. Or do we want something that is more sensible. So we have all this planning it, and you know, we've done the time boxing and the estimation and, and that's awesome, but bugs are there to, uh, you know, to ruin our good, uh, good plans. Ugh, bugs, right? Ugh. For the crowd at home that doesn't see me, I'm shaking my hand. I'm still doing that. <laughs> all right, I've stopped. So bugs are really costly. They're probably even more costly than they might appear because first, obviously, you need to fix it. So it costs you the money, right? I'm talking now about projects, uh, not contribution. You, it costs you the money to fix that, but on the same time, it takes, it takes your time. Like if we have a deadline, 
that same developer who should have uh, written something for a feature is actually wasting their time on, uh, on fixing uh, the bugs. Client is disappointed. And this is where I always uh, give the mechanic example uh, because I've seen it so many times. So if I have problem with my uh, car brakes and I go to a mechanic and I ask him to fix it and then he tells me, you know, I fixed it and I go out of the garage and the brakes are not working again, this is not cool. I will most probably not, no, go, not go back to that mechanic. But as developers or as, you know, as website builders, when we, how do you say fuck up without it sounding obscene? <laughs> we kind of expect the client to be cool with that and like, oh yeah, it's bugs. So yeah, having bugs, that's fine. Having the same bug twice, it's, it should be embarrassing for, for, for everybody. And last but not least is the developers and the account manager. I call project manager, account manager for me is the same. It's the morale, like you're kind of losing face, losing face when you go to the account manager and you say, yeah, I have yet uh, another bug. And this is something that troubled me, those bugs, until I came across two years ago when I started dealing with Elm, and don't worry, we're getting close to the code uh, stuff, is that word that I was missing and that I've learned thanks to Elm is the idea of correctness. So I wanna share with you a bit of a, my expectations from computers, how they can assist me in making sure that I do not have um, those bugs. Let's start. Uh, It's completely lost. One second. The cost of double clicking on something. All right, let's hope that's a little better. Okay, I'm gonna show you real quickly a web application we developed. It's headless Drupal with a front in Elm. This is basically for teachers that they are able to create lessons and broadcast it to students. Well, what you're seeing here is what we call a board template. That is a teacher is able to go in, drag and drop images, add different text, add freehand, add, add lines, change the order of the slides, add a quiz, with different questions and set different uh, answers for those. And then when they are done, they can launch what we call a live session so a student can go in, enter uh, four digits pin code, and then be redirected to that live session where the teacher can uh, change everything and in real time we can see it reflected. A student can write their own text and then the teacher can drill down, add some feedback, take control over the student even, and you know, add their own uh, lines or text and, um, and whatnot. They can go back, they can set, um, they can start a quiz so a student can answer it, and the, the teacher will see in real time the, um, the answers. Well. So, one of the reasons I'm super excited about that, that application, the same excitement I see on your faces, <laughs> is that none of it existed five and a half months ago. That's, that's, completely, that's completely new. I don't think anything, like if I would use another JavaScript uh, framework, I would, never, I would never reach that. And another thing that I really like is the backend is the same Drupal that you and I uh, love to love and love to hate. We are using uh, headless Drupal, uh, Drupal 7, sorry, and what you can see is that it's a node, right? If I wrote some text, it's, I, I can see the text and I can see, uh, I can see the different attributes. So that application, this is probably the biggest application that uh, we've written uh, in Elm. As you can see, it's very feature-rich and I've never felt more confident about uh, a, a web application as I feel with that specific application. So, I gave you the teaser of what Elm is, but I haven't uh, 
gone deep and we are going to go a little deeper right now. So I've been using, we've been using Angular 1 for uh, many years, more years that, uh, that I'd like to remember, and I was quite frustrated with Angular 1 for all the right reasons, and then I started poking around with uh, React and Angular 2 and whatnot, but soon enough I found myself with Elm. So what is Elm? Elm is a functional programming, it's, uh, it's, you write it at the Elm language, and then it's compiled to JavaScript, but it's not TypeScript, in the sense that it doesn't try to fix JavaScript. It, rather says JavaScript is a wonderful language, but we as humans do not need to interact uh, directly with it. It's statically typed, it has an amazing compiler that really assists you building your application, you don't have to, uh, to fight with it, and it has zero runtime exceptions. And that, that's a pretty powerful, that's a powerful uh, guarantee. And after all those years with Angular 1 transitioning into Elm, suddenly it, it, it it, for us, uh, we've transitioned from really hating, or me personally, really hating writing uh, front-end code because after two weeks you get a spaghetti you don't control into something that I really, really enjoy. And in fact, after diving into Elm and diving into this whole functional programming world, I've started noticing the different flaws that I saw in Drupal. Like, we were, we were seeing we were using techniques or we were seeing uh, the, computers, uh, the computer assisting, is, assisting us in writing the application in a manner that kind of made us envy uh, uh, Elm and wanting to have the, the, the benefits of Elm in Drupal itself. So the mandatory, sorry, the mandatory counter example, I will go over it quite quickly and then we'll show a, a, a bit more elaborated um, Elm code and we'll go over it together so you can understand how to think Elm. So, a counter example, uh, if you can guess what the application is doing, you will win a counter example application. <laughs> yeah, and you click on the plus, it's being incremented. When you click on the minus, it's being decremented. Can you see there? The if you can see, good for you. If you cannot see, I'm so sorry about that. So I will not go over every single line of code and you don't need to understand every single line of code, but you need to understand uh, the concept. And if you're not a developer and you're sitting in the room, don't shut down immediately because it's not very, very complicated. It's logical, I, I find it's way more logical than just JavaScript and everything. So just listen to the different concepts, different concepts that we have here. So along with Elm, we have a thing called the Elm architecture, which is kind of how to structure your web applications. So uh, we, as we know, there is an MVC in, in Elm, it's called a uh, model update view. So how is it done? So first of all, I have my model. The model would be an integer. Since it's a compiled language, it means that if I will try to pass to the model something wrong, like uh, a character, a string, it will not let me compile it. So I'm just saying the model can be just an integer and it's going to start with the number zero. Then the next thing that we have over here is a new type, which is basically what are the possible actions that I can do on my model. And this is pretty awesome. Again, if you developing with Angular 1 or we react without Redux, then that, that's probably very appealing to you because it's in two lines, I can know exactly what kind of changes I'm going to have and this is decrement and increment. These are the only actions that I can have on my model. And then in my update function, I can see that if it's decremented, then I'm gonna decrement the model. If it's incremented, I'm gonna increment the model, and this is an immutable mo model, meaning I'm not returning the same model, I'm not returning the same object, I'm just returning something, a, a, a different object. And then I have the view function, which kind of resembles HTML, it's not exactly HTML, it's compiled, which means that you cannot have a typo in the name of the button or the div or whatnot. And then I can see that over here I have on click decrement it means that 
when you're interacting with the HTML, the actual uh, um, incrementation, incrementing or decrementing does not happen in the HTML itself. The only thing it's doing, it is calling the update function here on top. It is gonna pass it the action increment or increment along with the model and it's gonna get all the, all the business logic is gonna happen in the up update function itself. So with, it, with Elm, we have this idea of compile error versus runtime mistakes. And I'm not writing runtime exceptions because there are no runtime exceptions in Elm. So the idea is that we try to shift as much as possible in our um, logic into something that the compiler can recognize and stop us from doing, uh, from doing mistakes. So let's do a types 101 really, really quickly until, uh, so we can dive into a, a, a slightly more complicated example. So here's type boolean, the way it is um, defined in, Drupal core, in, uh, in Elm core uh, itself. It is either a false or a true. That's it. Here is another definition that I've written, a completely arbitrary type. So first of all, I have type alias name equals strings. It means from now on, Elm will treat the word name as if it was just a string. So I'm able to define, I have a user type over here. It can either be anonymous, it can either be authenticated, which is basically wrapping a name, that is wrapping a string. So al as along with knowing that the current user is authenticated as part of this type, I'm gonna hold, I'm gonna wrap the value which is gonna be the name of the user. And let's say I have a premium user type, then that will wrap the name and let's say the expiration date of that user. So let's see a cart example. Up until now, if you've been in other presentations that I've given, this is the amount of code that I've shown, but I have one hour to fill. They were very clear in the email that I need to fill one hour. So I'm gonna dive a little bit more. It's not gonna be live code, but um, I'm gonna live code, not really. Impressive, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the commerce guys want to guy. You want to buy it? <laughs> it's gonna cost you fifty, and the currency is not defined. <laughs> 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 All right. So we have a cart example. There's absolutely no interaction going with that cart. I have a cart content that is holding one shirt and two pants, and the total is 50. This is the, the, that, that's the essence of our application. It's not very, very fancy. But what I want to do is actually show you how we're starting to think Elm and how Elm helps us shape a solution uh, for that. And the way we're doing it is we're starting by modeling the, the problem. And in a way, when we're doing it in Drupal, we're doing it the same thing. I think you probably, uh, similar to me in the sense that when you're hearing about a feature, then you don't really think immediately, oh, I'm gonna do it with, with views or C tool plugin. That's like kind of a side effect of what you'll have. You're probably thinking first, what are the different content types? What is the entity? What are the references between them? You build your data structure. The same thing with Elm. I'm starting with the types. Once I define them correctly, then everything kind of, you know, advances naturally. So, I could start first with saying I have a type alias, which is an item, which is basically just saying I have a record that that could be the name, a string, amount will be integer, and some arbitrary ID that is gonna be integer, and then I can define a shirt. Like, you can see every function is always returning a value. I don't need to write return. And I'm saying shirt, this is the type, is gonna return uh, an item. I don't really have to put it. Elm can live with that, it's an inferred type. In fact, it will also tell me, um, it, it, it will give me a hint. Can we see it? We cannot see it here. It will give me a hint to what, uh, what I could write as the type signature. So I would, sorry. 
In the shirt, I define the record, this is shirt, this is the amount, this is the ID, and obviously, like we said, this is a compiled language, this is statically typed language. If instead of an integer, I'm gonna write a string, then immediately the system is telling me, hey, you have a problem with, uh, with the amount field, so you know what to change. So I have my shirt, and I have my pants. That's it, I've defined an item. Next thing that I'm gonna have is a type alias of added item, which is a record that is gonna hold the item itself along with the quantity that is gonna be an integer. So added shirt, for example, would be, I'm showing you two different syntaxes, syntax that it's actually the same thing. I can either write it as a record or I can use the type itself directly and then do it by the order. And then finally, I have the type alias cart and I can have a list of added items. So an empty cart would look something like that, and the cart items would be a list along with the added shirt and the added pants. That's it, like once I got it right, then writing the application as well, I could have bugs obviously, but I got my data structure correctly, and then everything goes out naturally from here, so let's see how it evolves. So let's look, for example, at getting the total of the cart. How do we do it? And right now what I'm gonna explain is exactly the same explanation uh, two years ago Amitai would have loved to get from somebody in a presentation. Because when I saw this list fold L, this is one of the steps I think that really stops people from uh, looking into Elm more seriously. They go into the Elm, they see new syntax, it looks a little daunting, it's not really clear what fold L is and they stop. It happened to me and this is uh, a courtesy of me uh, <laughs> trying, uh, trying to prevent that from happening to you. So cart added items is a list. So I want to actually iterate over that list and start accumulating what is the total. So the way I'm doing it, I'm fold L like fold from the left, right? I think it's, you call it reduce in, in JavaScript talk. I'm passing the added items list along with a zero. What is the zero over here? This is my accumulator. I start with zero dollars and I start accumulating the information over here. So list fold L and then I have this anonymous function which is basically getting one by one the different added items and the accumulated total. So I can do a get amount, which is quite silly function that we'll talk about soon that is getting an item and it's returning me an integer. How, how much this item costs and it just returns the item amount. Remember that part. Do you remember it? Good. So get amount and I'm multiplying by the quantity and I uh, append it to the accumulator so in the end, I will get the 50, the same 50 we saw here. How would, look, how, would le, how would the card contents look? I'll have a view card function, it will get a card, it will return some HTML, and this time I want to iterate over my list of added items and just, I don't want to reduce it, I want for every item to have an LI in the HTML. So I just list map it over here and then again, I'm getting the added item in the function and I can build my HTML, which is basically adding an li, li tag along with the different information over here, right? This is, whoops, sorry. This is what we are seeing over here. All is fine, as beautiful, maybe you're slightly excited, but in the end, you know JavaScript. You could, you could do it with JavaScript. But what happens when I'm a little tired and in the get amount, instead of returning item amount, I return item ID. Remember how it looked, our item is an, uh, is an amount of type int and the ID of type int. The compiler is not barking at me because everything is fine, right? I'm returning an integer and now when I'm refreshing it, the total is five and I just lost my job because <laughs> I've sold a bunch of $50 worth uh, stuff 
in five. And this is where Elm really shines because I'm able to start adding type safety to the things. And I'm able to say, you know, this thing of amount, it's a pretty serious thing. I, I, I want to be sure that I'm not passing into different functions that are able to ex accept or return an integer. I just want to have my own type. And for that, I can uh, jump to another file that I've created at home where I'm doing exactly that. I will define a new amount, a new type called amount, which is actually amount which is wrapping an integer. Like the user type, right? We had authenticated, wrapping the name, same thing over here. And then here on my, on my, item, on my item record, the amount is now not of type integer, but rather on type amount. So when I define a shirt, I define amount 10. If I'll try to say an integer, I will get an error from the compiler. Having that, I now, I'm now required to do some more work in order to extract what's the actual amount value. How many dollars is that? Because I'm constantly going to get it wrapped with the type. So it's going to look something like that. Let's look at the get total cart. Again, I'm list folding over the added items, but this time the initial value is not zero, it is amount zero. And this time I, my a get amount function looks something like that. Uh, sorry, it is passing the amount. My get amount function is, I'm just piping it, it's like some fancy Elm stuff. I got I got my value and I can pass it on into multiple amount, which is a function that I've wrote here, which I'm saying you will get the integer. This is by the quantity, how much you want to uh, multiply with, with, along with the type called amount. And over here, what I'm doing, I'm actually extracting the amount out of the amount type. You see how I abuse the word amount? It's the same way we abuse the word content in Drupal. Amount is wrapping an amount. <laughs> So I'm able to extract it, I'm able to multiply it by the amount, and then later on, I'm able to wrap it again. I'll take that information and then I'll pipe it again into a new function called append amount, which would look something like that. It will get two amounts, it will unwrap it, it will append them, and then it will wrap it, around, wrap it with amount again. And then we indeed get, here I added the dollar, we get the same web application. It's performing the same way, but I have uh, better confidence in the type of application and I know I help, my, I help the compiler in helping me in structuring a better application. Let's do it in the end. All right, let's do it now. <laughs> we had a pressing question about the amount, uh, the, uh, the int amount amount. Is that the two values that come in, the value that comes out? Yeah, I, oh yeah, the type signature you mean? Yeah. Yes, the, exactly. Oh my God, you've been paying attention. <laughs> All right. Maybe values. This is again when I saw it, I was looking and I have two screens. It's not a real story, I don't have two screens, I don't want to lie to you, but imagine I have two screens. On one, I have Elm and I have this idea of maybe values and then I shift my hand into PHP and I have a bunch of not empty E sets scattered around and then I'm looking at maybe values again and I'm starting to envy it. And what is a maybe value? So let's imagine an application that I have a user in that application. So I de define a type Alice user. It's going to have an avatar URL and a name. And I'm going to say I have this thing of an empty user, meaning I've just initialized my application. I don't have the user yet. I didn't get it from the server. So I don't know what to fill in. So I'm saying it's an empty user. You don't, have real, you don't really have a name and you don't really have a URL. And this is completely and utterly wrong, right? Because there is no such thing as an empty user. 
the user was just not fetched yet. This is what I'm trying to describe. And the maybe value is basically saying, maybe you have a value. Meaning, I could actually structure it differently and say that user is a maybe user. So an empty user would actually be nothing. I still don't have it. Or if I would have something, then it will be uh, wrapped with just. Just is like the, uh, the, the opposite of a nothing. So now if I'll have like a function of view user that will get this maybe user, I can do what we call pattern matching, saying, case the, the, the maybe, that maybe user is, if it's nothing, then write text loading. And if it's the, the user, then just user, then you can print the username. And having this maybe values, and again, you always need to remember there is a compiler there. Once I'm saying it's a maybe value, I need to always make sure that I, I cannot suddenly forget to write not empty as we all do in our PHP code, the compiler will not allow us. But even here we have better patterns and better way of structuring our application because what happens if I did call and try to fetch my user from the server but you know, the, the, the HTTP request did not work. So if you're doing it in uh, Angular or React and you're like me, then you're probably telling yourself, what can possibly go wrong, right? Why, sh why shouldn't the server answer? Like it's, I, d I cannot foresee any situation that me as a developer need to take care of it of actually dealing with a server error, right? Some, some relate to it more than others, obviously. <laughs> so we have this pattern that we call remote data or web data, which we're basically saying fetching remote information is actually uh, four steps or four different uh, options. One, the first one is not asked. I did, I, I'm just initializing my application. I did not ask it yet or I didn't click the button yet. The second is loading. I'm currently... Uh, in flight, I'm currently requesting for that thing. And then I have this failure along with the actual error, wrapping the error, or the success with the actual uh, value that, that, I, that I got. So in this case, I would model the user as web data user. An empty model would be not asked. A debug user would be success wrapping the user. And then my view user would look a little differently where I'm saying, if it's a success, print the username. If it's a failure, print something went wrong. And over here, this underscore that I'm using as, as basically saying, okay, if it's not success or it's not failure, that is if it's not ask or loading, let's say, just show a spinner or something like that. Like I don't have really to write every single item. I could have this underscore trick. I love Elm. It completely changed the way I'm uh, looking at development. And as a result, I was looking at what can we have on the server side that would uh, give me the same effect. So I was, started, I, I was looking at uh, Haskell, which is like the father and mother of all those functional programming languages. And can I assure you, it has a huge learning curve. I know that some people are saying like the, it doesn't have. It does. It's really hard to. It's it's really harder than learning PHP, for example. But again, it's it, it's pretty amazing in terms of how it helps you shift the way you are thinking uh, about development. So, uh, where am I? Sorry. So. We're not currently running in Gizra anything uh, uh, made in Haskell in production, but uh, let's say that I'm actively working on that. And I'm specifically working with a framework called uh, Yesod. So I want to show you real quickly, much quicker than before, a different example of how I approach it. So if you know RESTful, for example, in Drupal 7, this API slash login token where I, say, where I send the basic authentication with my username and password in the authorization header, I want to get my login token back. This is kind of the JSON that I want to have. So how would I do it uh, with Yesod? There's a bunch of magic key stuff that's going in, uh, that's, that goes, but I, I, I just want to show you the essence. So I will define 
I will first define my different models. Again, I'm structuring, I'm modeling my problem. So over here I can see I have um, a user and even the password, for example, if the password is optional, I can say that, that it's gonna be of type text, but it's a maybe, right? And I'm gonna have my access token and the created is actually of, of, of a, a, date, a date type and the user ID is of type user ID which is basically taking the user itself and adding the ID. And that's super important, that user ID, because it's unlike you know, PHP or something that you would say, okay, this is an integer. This is not an integer. This is a user ID. This is the key of an entity of type user. I, I would not be able to suddenly um, uh, place in the, uh, in the access token instead of a user ID, an article ID. This is the type safety that I'm getting on the model on the model level, and you thought we'll parse this uh, models file and will actually create the database for me according to the information that I have here. So configuring the routes, I'm saying API login token, and it's matched to a certain handler called login token R, R for handler, and the allowed method is gonna be get. And this is how my handler is going to look. So I have this get login token because this is the get method, and over here I'm saying, okay, give me the UID, which is the current user, it's a require uh, user ID, and then in order to get the access token, I, I want to validate that I indeed have this, I have this access token, I'm running a DB query, which I'm asking, select first, bring the first access token user ID, which, is, which equals a UID. But it's not an equal between two integers, this is an equal between to uh, user ID keys, meaning that thing you see here, this access token user ID, this is thanks to the fact that I have the word access token over here and user ID, meaning this is type. Or in other words, I'm unable to write an SQL query that is not valid. I'm unable to call a column that does not exist. <laughs> not that it ever happened to any of us in production, <laughs> and since I'm running it on the database, then you sort of know that I'm not guaranteed to always get that information. I'm not definitely getting an access token. I'm actually calling getting a maybe access token, right? So everything is sitting inside those type safety, and the compiler is always there to make sure, maybe a little annoying, Right? that I cannot deploy everything that I want, but it's stopping me from having those errors. And if I have this uh, tiny uh, user profile that I can see my access token and regenerate one and have a login token link, just to show you how the template is structured, obviously with a type safety manner, that is, if we look on the div over here, the href is not, I do not write API login token, but rather I'm saying it's, redirected to login token R, meaning that if I go to the config routes and change it and recompile my application, it will automatically make sure that all my, uh, all my URLs are correct and type safe. And the last one, and this is, this is an example that I want because once you get a taste of type safety, I think you kind of, it's hard for you to stop like looking for when can I, where can I add more type safety? So Drupal is definitely taking the what can go wrong approach with Drupal at CSS, right? Drupal at CSS, I wanna add the static CSS, bootstrap CSS, and how do you know if it's working or not? You're hitting F5, either you see your CSS stay in action or you do not see that, right? But in Yesod I can, or in Yesod or in a type safe, uh, uh, statically type, um, language, I'm adding this style sheet with CSS underscore bootstrap underscore CSS. This is actually the type safe identifier of that file, meaning when I compile my application, then uh, on compile time, it's actually gonna check if that file is there. And if it's not there, then it will not allow me to compile it. Finally, Drupal 8, and I'm actually gonna talk about organic groups just a little.
So I've apologized about organic groups uh, 1.x many times. This is not one of those cases. This is just a retrospective of what we had. So in organic groups 1.x, the way, uh, the way uh, I've created the, the entities that you have to remember, field API was born, fields are everywhere, and entity API model was, a new, uh, was the new kid on the block. And what we've done is, we had this idea of a group content, a node or any entity, but I'll call it node just for simplicity. It could have been a group content, meaning a content that belongs to a group, that is contained inside a group. We had a group entity, right? And we had the membership, the OG membership entity, which is kind of what is holding the information about a certain member along with different metadata, what is active or is the user active or pending, when did they uh, join the membership and so on and so forth. And in 1.x we actually had like, we had the group entity which was uh, pointing to the group node. Now, I've actually deliberately did not add the words entity and node over here just because I wanted it to be for you as confusing as it was for us back then. <laughs> so for that reason, in 2.x, we've decided uh, to stop abusing the entity API system in a way and remove that group entity and just the membership would reference the two nodes. And instead, I've decided to slightly abuse the field API. So the problem there was that I kind of decided that you would be able to work both with the entity, uh, with the entity API or with the field API and create those uh, membership. Now, I, know, I, don't know if, uh, I don't know if for that ID I will one day be punished or that the punishment itself was, uh, was uh, trying to code that. And in OG8, right now, we've, we're doing something which at least at this point of time seems much more sensible. And it is saying um, a user is not a node, <laughs> right? Makes sense now. Oh my God, what was I saying? <laughs> Why didn't you stop me, Moshe? You knew it all along, right? <laughs> you knew the answer. So a membership, like it doesn't really make sense of having a membership that it's related to a node. It just makes sense when you relate it to a user. So we've changed it that the membership is now referencing uh, a user for sure, and the group and the group content is related to to a group via entity via entity reference itself. And if you have an edge case that you are using the uh, you are abusing the OG membership. I can tell you I no longer care about edge cases. That's, I mean, there are other ways of doing that, but now the mindset of trying to write this OG8, if you remember what we talked about 45 minutes ago, sticking to the essence, stick, sticking to the, important, uh, to the important stuff. So the same way I've praised, uh, um, the same way I've talked about the costs of, bug, of bugs and uh, the, 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 the unknown costs in a way, I could praise the benefits of removing code or not writing code at all. So if you have a code that was never written, it does not have bugs. <laughs> it doesn't take time to write it and maintenance is super easy. So that's kind of exactly the mindset is, you know, it's adding features and not reducing, not necessarily like reducing from previous version, right? Drupal 9, if you're here in the audience, let me repeat that. It's adding new features, not necessarily reducing from the previous one, right? So we talked about types, and I don't have that in PHP. The best that I can do are the safeguards, and this is, you can see it all over Drupal 8 itself, is making sure that if you didn't pass something right into the API function, then at least in terms of data integrity, we're gonna throw an exception and make it very, very clear and not have some uh, small notices or, or errors that are silently uh, being, uh, being uh, eaten. So, I'm not super excited about Drupal 8. I don't know if you heard it in my tone when I was speaking with you outside or not or from the fact that I've told you that I'm not super excited about Drupal 8. <laughs> In the end, I'm always like, I'm judging it from a business point of view that 
personally, for me, for Grisra, Drupal 8 isn't a significant, uh, um, significantly different from Drupal 7. It is different. But if I'm comparing it for the difference from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, I don't see that value, right? So that's why I, I, I gave this uh, tiny background just to say that I think that in that sense of testing, Drupal 8 is doing something really, really right. And that's the fact that I have three different levels of testing that I can do. The functional testing, the kernel testing, and the unit testing. So really quickly, the functional testing is, this is really banging your head in the wall because it takes for so long, but whenever we're dealing with access or stuff like that, that we want to be absolutely sure that it's working, we are working the functional, we are writing the functional test. The kernel test is kind of the go-to uh, testing that we're doing because, um, it's basically installing Drupal much quicker because we're telling it which models exactly to enable and which um, uh, tables uh, to install. And unit testing is a beautiful uh, uh, fantasy story in the format of PHP, uh, uh, PHP lines that we have it because sometimes you don't have anything else. Um, I've said my piece about uh, the testing. So what is wrong with Drupal? Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> I'm kidding. But I give an example specifically uh, from, uh, from OG8. But it applies also to OG7. So let's have this scenario in OG. So you have an article. This is a group content. Um, you don't have, the user does not have a site-wide permission to create an article but you have an OG permission to create an article, and you have your group audience field set up, but it is not required, right? So we have a problem. I, I cannot allow you, I shall not allow you to create an article without a group associated with that, otherwise I get those annoying security issue emails that I don't want to solve. I mean, I don't want to reach that point of having the security issue. So how should I treat it? I should probably smart enough and make the widget required in, in that situation. And then I need to remember that you can actually have multiple group audiences. So I cannot make it required, but I still have to listen to the form state and make sure that at least we have one, one group. I cannot force you on each, on each field because you're not required to have uh, two groups. And this is the problem that I'm seeing in Drupal. I mean, there are other problems maybe, but this is the problem for me that when I'm looking, and I, there are a lot of parts that I, Drupal, that I really love and a lot of parts in Drupal that I really hate. It's not necessarily about the code itself. It's about looking at different things that are not Drupal and then looking into Drupal and saying, I have this problem. And as a maintainer, when I'm writing this generic solution that needs to fit into this big generic thing, I need to take care of all those uh, security issues and edge cases. And every time you will use OG, or to that matter, any other model, I'm just bashing my own model over here, every time any of your end users gonna hit F5, it's gonna run through that complexity. It's gonna run through that lines of code that are treating something that you actually don't need. And I, I'm seeing it a lot of, I'm hearing it a lot, uh, many times that when we have discussion like with developers about a project and we're asking, how should we do it? And somebody suggests a model and then he says, yeah, we can, yeah, I don't know, get uh, views filters and we're getting it for free. And that for free is completely false. Because you are paying a, a certain price, either on complexity or either on, you know, you're relying on something that you don't really need. You remember that actually my third slide was talking about what is the essence? The for free is often not the essence, no. The essence of your project is not having this page with all those select filters with Ajax as all of us have with the views, with the views, uh, with the views filter. And in fact, I wrote an OG functionality, a group functionality in Yesod in five different files instead of 150 different files, and I got it working perfectly. It obviously did not cover, I don't know, 
10, uh, did not cover as much as OG does, but I didn't need all of OG. I didn't need all of Drupal. I just needed my thing. <laughs> so <laughs> I've actually changed it. Like, if you, maybe you've seen that slide in one of presentation. It said, pour Drupal to Haskell, and it was no exclamation mark. And yesterday, I've changed it to probably no. Like, I'm trying. <laughs> And obviously, no, it's not going to change. I mean, Drupal has a lot of, a lot of value. It's approachable, right? Uh, I've started as a non-developer. I wouldn't be able to start with Haskell. I'm starting with PHP, which was easier. It has huge community. It has a big ecosystem with Pantheon and Platform Sage and Amazio, and it has monthly releases and security releases. We have DrupalCon, Drupal Association, Drupal Drama, Drupal Consul, Drush. Tons of code we didn't write, and 50 years of experience. And that's actually the most important part for me. And now that my uh, hour-long uh, uh, session is coming to, to, to looking at that, at what is, what is Drupal? And I remember that Dries, back in uh, DrupalCon Copenhagen, was, t was answering a question about our relation with PHP, and he was saying, well, Drupal, we are tied, how did you say it? Uh, we are tied in the hip to the PHP community. It made a lot of sense. But nowadays, when I'm looking at things, and I'm looking at things a little differently, I'm asking myself, are we really? Are we really attached to PHP because we are choosing every day that this is what we want? Or are we afraid of saying, oh my God, maybe decisions that we've taken uh, some time ago we're wrong. And I'm not advocating to let go of PHP, but what I'm actually advocating is to letting go of our fears, in a way. I feel that Drupal is in its safe zone, right? And its safe zone is the coding part. Like, we're constantly writing code, as if, if we we'll write a lot of code, one day we'll get it right. One day everything would be, we, everything would be perfect, right? And I'll, tell, I'll, and I'll tell you what I tell often my clients. Our problem is not code. When I tell my clients, I tell them, listen, your, your problem is not code. Like everybody, your problem is marketing and sales. And let's say you have a perfect system. Let's say we have a perfect, I don't know what, some AI machine that we would tell it to do everything that we want. So the first question would be, what do we want, <laughs> right? But that's not even the important question. The important question is, let's say we have that perfect system. Now what? What are we doing with it? In a way, I feel that Drupal is kind of a solution looking for a problem. And I think we need to sit and think about what do we want to do? And that sitting is not necessarily something that needs to take years. It can be in a similar way to how we do coding. It can be a very iterative and a fast-paced way, uh, way of doing that. And this, another thing that I tell my clients, and I'm pretty harsh with the client because sometimes we're actually doing that, is tell them, you know, your problem is not code, and to show you that, we're stopping to develop. <laughs> we're taking a break. It's going to be a two weeks break or it's going to be a one month break. And suddenly, this is about moving from the comfort zone. You have to deal with the real things instead of going back and coding. And even though it's quite radical, and I don't believe it's going to necessarily uh, gonna happen, a real suggestion is let's look at Drupal and decide that we're not coding Drupal for two weeks. No one is working on core for two weeks. Is that really crazy? I don't know, like when the end of the world will reach, or 10 years from now, when Drupal will completely die, it will actually happen, right? We didn't, we didn't decide to do it. But now we can decide. And why would we do it? Because if we're stopping, then suddenly it releases us from our fears in a way, and it gives us time to reflect, to deal with other stuff. And by getting out of the comfort zone, and I can assure you, I'm trying to get myself out of the comfort zone. You've seen it on the first slide and on the second. I'm doing that myself. It has a lot of value because you're starting to question the things that you're doing in a very honest way and dealing with those fears, I think, in, in a way that you select to do it 
could really benefit us. So in order not to finish just with this uh, uh, reflective and theory stuff, I'd like you to encourage the people who got uh, at least slightly excited about uh, Headless Drupal and Elm. We have this Gizra Drupal M starter, which basically gives you a Drupal 7 with RESTful and Migrate and different best practices and the Elm functionality and crazy Travis integration that knows how to run your simple test and BHAT test and WebDriver IO test and Aaron Novak, one of Gizra's um, uh, developers, has just uh, added a nifty functionality that if your WebDriver IO test is failing on Travis, it's actually capturing a video of that. It uploads it to Google Drive and then submits an, uh, a comment in the, in the GitHub issue so you can know why it's failing. So, two last things. One is the evaluation. That I encourage you to write the evaluation, but I encourage you more to come and actually take uh, advantage of the fact that we are here. Um, I love hearing how awesome my presentations are, I really do. I slightly less enjoy hearing how they were not good, but I, it's actually what's more uh, interesting for me to hear those things just so I can uh, um, improve it for the next time. So this is definitely personally about me. And if you got excited about it and uh, it made sense and you happen to be an amazing developer and you happen to be looking for a job, then in Giza we are hiring, and thank you very much. <laughs> exactly one hour, exactly. If somebody in the Drupal Association is asking, it was exactly one hour.